Eurodynamics Review. Okay, this was titled Eurodynamics 101. This is usually like an eight-hour day. I know everybody does full lectures and this. Trying to get this one in, I had a hard time, but we'll do our best. So this goes, just go back to building on the concepts that Dr. Wien introduced earlier about this storage and emptying problem. So first, my definition, or what I expect for normal storage. Normal sensations, typically between 100 to 200 cc's. Normal capacity, typically between 400 to 600 cc's. Normal storage pressures, or low storage pressures. So pressures usually in the low, you know, below 10 or low teens. Um, low intravesical pressures allow for produce urine to keep coming down the ureters, uh, prevents reflux, so you protect the upper tracts. And you should have appropriate sensations and no accidents. You should be continent. Your outlet should be dry. Emptying should be a coordinated and a volitional event under your control, and it should be a contraction that lasts long enough and strong enough to allow for adequate emptying. So your dynamically, that translates to bladder relaxation, outlet, or it says urethral, but basically outlet contraction or outlet higher pressures, low pressures in the bladder, higher pressures in the outlet. Then during voiding, it's the opposite, bladder relaxation, outlet, um, sorry, bladder contraction, outlet relaxation. So when there's a lower urinary tract dysfunction, it's gonna be due to one of the following or combination, a failure to store. And if it's a failure to store, it's either a bladder problem or an outlet problem or both. If it's a failure to empty, it's either a bladder problem or an outlet problem or both. And it can be a failure to store and a failure to empty. So that's where this really comes into play. Um, so you can use this approach to steer through the complicated cases. You don't need it for everything, but it kind of makes sense. You have, Brian, I think mentioned this earlier, female stress incontinence. That's a failure to store, outlet. I don't need your dynamics to tell me because it's so obvious. But if I had a patient who's got stress incontinence and an elevated residual, now I need to know why the residual is high. Is it an obstruction present? Is the bladder's not squeezing strong enough? So that's where it gets, these, this kind of algorithm will steer you through the more complicated patients. To assess failure to store, it's gonna be by the CMG, which will get most of it. And then the outlet will be assessed by either the leak point pressures or urethral pressure profiles. Um, failure to empty, it's gonna be assessed by the pressure flow study. AUA did come out with your dynamic guidelines back in 2012. Um, it, it was a good effort. Um, the problem is, is that all of the entities that you see on the column on the left, stress and contents, they came out with their own guidelines. Overactive bladder came out with their own guidelines. Neurogenic bladder just came out with their own guidelines. So the, each guideline puts your dynamics into place based on where the guidelines are, their guidelines. So these, these, the your dynamic guidelines kind of helped at the time because we didn't have anything else. Now, probably the, the disease entities guidelines are probably more accurate. So this is a busy slide and I tried to condense everything. Um, again, for stress incontinence, for example, you don't need urodynamics for straightforward stress incontinence. Um, guideline, the AUS, the urodynamic guidelines were written in such a way we very were very worried about like saying you don't need urodynamics because then insurance companies would take those guidelines and they were like, well, you don't need stress incontinence, you don't have to do urodynamics on the stress incontinence patient. Well, you do if she's had her third or fourth surgery. Well, the guidelines say you don't need to. So we were very sensitive to that concern. So it'll say things like, you may perform your dynamics. We didn't want to like outright say you can't or you should. Um, but for the stress and continence straightforward index patient, you don't need to do it. Surgical planning, you probably don't need to do it either unless you really believe your dynamics is going to guide your treatment decision. Um, stress and continence without hypermobility. Again, if you don't have hypermobility on physical exam, probably it's ISD or some component of it. We, have, we know what options are better for that. I don't need your dynamics for that either. Failed incontinence surgery, then I might be doing it. I want to know if I'm missing something. You don't, uh, the, the assessment for the occult stress incontinent patient who has got prolapse, who doesn't complain, you don't need urodynamics for that. You can do that on a physical exam. Similar for overactive bladder, urgent incontinence, you don't need to do it for straight line therapy. If they have failed therapy, now you have to be able to figure out, are they failing therapy because they're just a refractory OAB patient, in which case then just move on to third line therapy. Or are they a complicated overactive bladder patient? They have MS. They have diabetes. They have a previous outlet procedure. Now they're now you don't know, and you really would use your dynamics to help with that. Um, lower your tract symptoms. You don't need your dynamics to assess for bladder outlet obstruction in a male. For most men, most guys that they come in with a residual of urine you know, retention, weak flow prior to that, and they come into retention with a residual of 300 cc's, no other medical risk factors. You can probably just do their outlet procedure. Most of you do that. On the other hand, when the guy comes in with a retention with an one and a half liters in his bladder, or he's a poorly controlled diabetic. I want to know if his bladder's still working, and I want to know if he went to retention because he's just atonic. That's where your dynamics will help you. 
neurogenic bladder, neurogenic bladder or NLUTD, we just went over that, so yes. Um, we saw a case earlier about someone who had incontinence after a pelvic trauma, so that, that would make sense. Recurrent UTIs, not for me, um, but on the other hand, if you have a pediatric patient, I don't know, my pediatric urologist tend to do them if they have elevated residuals and potential risk for reflux. I bring up the need for a diary. We all know you're supposed to get them. The diary really has a couple things to help you. Number one, if you think provider handwriting is bad, patient handwriting is worse. <laughs> this looks really neat, right? So I said to the, you know, I knew what happened. You know, they, they, they fill it out in the waiting room while they're there because they know I'm going to be asking for it. And this one I actually got on her case. I was like, I cannot believe you don't have the respect for me that you can actually fill out the diary when it happens. And she looks at me, she starts crying. She goes, Dr. Krauss, my, my head had on little pieces of paper and I had, my handwriting was so bad, I wrote it over so you could understand it. I felt this big and I never said it again. But that being said, it does help you because if the bladder diary shows they're avoiding 80 cc's, it gives you a target. When you're doing your urodynamics on them, don't expect to get to two or 300 cc's on those patients. They're, they're not gonna make it. On the other hand, if they are holding two or 300 cc's on their diary, and at 80 cc's, they're crying, saying, I gotta go, something's not right. You, maybe the catheter's curled, maybe they had more in their bladder than you gave it, expected, maybe you didn't empty it so well, because chances are, they probably have more in there and you should re redo it. Your flows, they never look like a bell-shaped curve. They typically look like something in between the two. Um, the problem with this is you can't tell if this patient has a voiding problem because they're obstructed or if they have a weak or an atonic bladder. So you can theorize. I, I know one person, Alan, you probably, Derek Griffiths, was the only person who ever, I could show him a, a urinal tracing, and he was spot on every time that he got it. But I don't think anybody else can do it. These are the measurements that you'll get with urodynamics. Again, we probably should hopefully know all these things. Just remember the detrusive pressure is not an actual pressure. It is a subtracted pressure from the two pressures that you can get. But most important is that now I can take the pressure the Euroflow flow rate and the pressure I got for the detrusor and put them together. And now I can make intelligent comments about their voiding system, if they're obstructed or not. I'm gonna jump on these two pictures because that's basically an assessment of your dynamics. Um, so bringing it back, failure to store, either gonna be assessed by the CMG, VLPP or UPP. Um, failure to empty is gonna be assessed by the pressure flow study. If I have a failure to store patient, it's either due to the bladder, overactivity, sensory problems, impaired compliance, those are the ones I'm most interested in. Due to the outlet, it's gonna be an incompetent outlet. Either they have hypermobility or um, the old terminology used to be genuine stress incontinence. I never knew what that meant compared to fake stress incontinence, um, but that was the term they used. Or ISD. For the systemetrogram part, this is how I remember. Even now, I still use this because I have a bad memory. So three C's and two S's. I know that, that's ingrained in my brain, and everything else is like the three C's. There's capacity, there's compliance, what's the other one? Competence, that doesn't make sense because there is no O for outlet, but it, I, that, that's how I remember it. And then sensations and stability or, or overactivity. Um, starting with overactivity, there's basically, I classify them to two types, phasic DO or terminal DO. This is an exaggerated page of, of uh, example of phasic DO. Basically, it means the contractions occurred and they would go away and you can continue your study. Terminal DO usually implies that they had a contraction, they just could not abort it, and they couldn't stop it, and it's not just a leak, they completely evacuate their bladder. Examples of compliance, normal compliance on the left-hand side. The only thing I apologize on this slide is the pedotrusor on the left is red, pedotrusor on the right is green. That's an impaired compliance, and actually at that yellow arrow, the patient is leaking. This is an interesting story, because this was a patient with spina bifida, it was a medical student, saw me put in a sphincter and said, I leak, I want one of those. I was like, mm, after we did this, no you don't. Because their leak point pressure was 66. The only thing I would be doing, we know 40 is the magic number, right? If I had put in a sphincter, I would only have elevated the pressure even higher, putting her in higher risk. So this is a good example mentioned earlier about if you're gonna do some sort of outlet procedure on somebody, make sure their storage parameters are good, because if not, you will make them worse. Competence of the outlet, it's not as important as it used to be. It used to be very important when the only surgeries I had back when I trained was a birch. I heard someone mention birch earlier. Birch is actually a good surgery for the right patient. I mean, it works, but it's invasive. Um, or sling. So back then, it was a fascial sling only. So a lot of people didn't know how to do fascial slings. So they knew how to do birches. So they would do your dynamics to say, oh, you're a candidate for a birch because they have a high leak point pressure. Oh, you're a candidate for 
a sling because you have a low lead point pressure, and that's how we would go. You use the VLPP or UPP. It's not as relevant anymore. The most important thing to remember is if you want to measure ISD, 100 to but greater than 100 is considered normal. Less than 60 is considered ISD. Somewhere in between is a gray zone. Most people just use 100. Pressure flow studies, I know I'm a little bit over, but I'm going to go over them on the extra time I, for my first talk. Pressure flow studies are the best way to measure the avoiding assessment, the avoiding part. It'll help you distinguish obstruction versus whether there's an atonic or a hypotonic bladder. Um, again, if they have failure to empty due to the, by the pressure flow study, you'll be able to tell hypotonic, atonic, or obstruction. I just said that. So normal voiding bladder should be able to contract under volitional control, and I mentioned earlier, strong enough and long enough to allow for adequate emptying. If the bladder's not functioning right, it's either too weak or it's not happening at all. But the big question is, the debatable question is, what is too weak? How much is enough? So if you've got someone who's generating a pressure of 30, is that still enough that maybe some sort of outlet procedure will get them out of retention? I was taught 25 was the magic number based on when I trained, Tim Boone said, if you look at a young guy who doesn't have a prostate problem, his voiding pressures are usually in the 20s. So if you want to, if you have a guy who doesn't have a prostate and his voiding pressures are 20 and you have another guy who's in retention, I want to get him back to that young man state. So they have to have at least a pressure of 20. On the other hand, one of our whole loop guys, he, I think he, his cutoff is 18. And I don't, they seem to do okay. I think they may allow them to adequately empty. It's something I don't know if you guys talk about, but something, something to think about. Pressure flow studies give you uh, clear outlet, clear indications for outlet obstruction in men. There's nomograms for it. There's equations for it. There, aren't such, there isn't such robust data for women. Um, I took what the UT Southwestern people used, um, Lamac and DeFries. They basically came up with the cut points of a flow of less than 12 and a pressure of greater than 24. So 20, 25 or greater. Um, if you have that combined criteria, then you're, they're obstructed. Um, we just talked about that. Okay. So here's examples of high, on the left-hand side, you've got um, high pressure, pressure's over 100, flow of about 12. That's obstructed. Even if they have a low residual, that is still obstructive voiding by, based on the flow and the pressure. In fact, if you actually, the definition of obstruction is low flow, high pressure. Residual is not actually part of the definition, but we bring it in. But it's a confusing thing. I've had people come in and say, oh, he's not obstructed. He's got a residual of five. No, he's obstructed. He's just emptying over. Okay. Uh, low flow, low pressure. It's important to notice on that one what the gender is, because if that's a guy, he's low flow, low pressure. If it's a female, it's actually not, because pressures are like about what you expect. EMG, not that important these days. Mostly what you're looking for is pattern changes. Um, assess during voiding and assess during storage and voiding. So when they cough or strain, you should see an increase in the EMG. When they, when they void, you should see a relaxation. If you want to make sure your EMG is working properly, you can do uh, bulbocavinosis cavernosis refluxes and such like that, but I don't put as much stock into EMGs as I used to. Now, for neurogenic patients, that's a different story. For neurogenic patients, I want to see, I like to see EMG changes increase during voiding and such. That helps. It's another way to confirm if the dyssynergia is present. On the other hand, fluoroscopy is probably the best way to assess for dyssynergia. You get to see the outlet. Again, these are all the things that you can get out of a fluoro study. On the other hand, I underlined what's most important. Again, looking for reflux. You can see the leak before you actually see the leak outside the body. So you might see the leak getting past the sphincter. I don't know if it has any clinical relevance, but you can at least see it. Um, maybe for that's the patient who complains of leakage, but on the urodynamic study, they don't leak. But if you see them, urine coming, the contrast coming past it, that would make me feel better. Um, voiding assessment, especially of the sphincter function, and then outlet obstruction. And on that note, urodynamics 101 is now done.